This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no bias. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political analysis here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver. Great to be back with you once again for another week, wherever you are across this great nation or around the world here on Truth Frequency Radio. And we trust that uh, those of you here in the good old United States of America, had a fun and exciting 4th of July weekend. You celebrated our independence. Maybe you had a little barbecue. Maybe you had a couple of beers. And you reflected upon what it means to be a resident of the greatest country and the greatest culture that this planet has ever known. It really puts a lot of things into perspective when you stop and think about it. Now, as we go back to business here, as we go back to the daily grind, as it were, on this show, something that we don't do a lot on this show is we don't do a lot of straight news. We, we, we don't read to you a lot of news stories or, or uh, try to do journalism per se. I let that leave that task to other people. Ordinarily, I, I believe that this audience is a fairly well-informed audience. We normally don't have to spend a lot of time regurgitating to you the news of the day. You come to us for analysis. You come to us for insight. You come to us, dare I say it even, for guidance sometimes. So we don't ordinarily spend a lot of time on this show repeating to you the news of the day. However, this week we're going to make just a little bit of a detour from that approach. I am going to read to you a couple of news stories here, and I'm going to read them to you so that maybe it can give you a little bit of context for something that has been in the news a lot, something that's been very controversial, something that's probably been, probably been peppering your Facebook and Twitter feeds with everybody's opinion on it. I'm going to give you about three news stories here. They're going to put this particular hot-button subject into perspective, so bear with me. This first news story comes from CNN.com. So for those of you who consider me a right, right-leaning right conservative ideologue, you'll notice that this story I'm about to read to you comes in its entirety from CNN.com, not known as a bastion of conservatism. Story was posted on the 4th of July, or last updated on the 4th of July at CNN.com. The uh, subject, the... Uh, Title is, Suspect in Killing of San Francisco Woman Had Been Deported Five Times. And I'm quoting from the article here. Kate Steinle was walking on a busy pier in San Francisco with her father when there was a single popping sound in the air. She fell to the ground, stuck by, struck by a bullet. The victim of what police say appears to be a random killing. The man accused of firing the deadly shot, 45-year-old Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez, is an undocumented immigrant a repeat felon who has been deported five times in Mexico, according to immigration officials. It would have been six, a federal law enforcement source told CNN, except authorities in San Francisco wanted him on a drug-related warrant. So U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which had Lopez Sanchez in its custody in March after his release from federal prison, turned him over to San Francisco deputies. I said they requested an immigration detainer, asking the agency be notified before Lopez Sanchez was released. But San Francisco is a city that doesn't honor such requests, and the Sheriff's Department released him. Fry O'Horn, Chief Legal Counsel of the San Francisco County Sheriff, told CNN that he was let go because there was no legal cause to detain the suspect. On Wednesday evening, he shot the 31-year-old Steinle at Pier 14 once in the upper body, according to police. He was found about a mile and a mile away an hour later and arrested. CNN cannot determine on Friday if he had an attorney. 
the story goes on to say, I'm going to skip ahead here, I said it turned Lopez Sanchez over to the San Francisco authorities on March 26 for an outstanding drug warrant. The agency requested an immigration detainer, but Horn said San Francisco officials believe that violates Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable searches and seizures. The sheriff's office said when Mr. Lopez Sanchez was booked into the jail, there was no active immigration and customs enforcement warrant or judicial order for removal for him. The department would have returned Lopez Sanchez if there had been a court order or warrant, it said. Charges were dropped on March 27th, but Lopez Sanchez was held until April 15th, while the sheriff's office determined there were no other warrants for his arrest and he had completed his federal prison sentence. According to KRON, San Francisco's policy on undocumented immigrants states that a law enforcement official shall not detain an individual on the basis of a civil immigration detainer after that individual becomes eligible for release from custody. The federal law enforcement source told CNN the sheriff's department didn't even need to hold him. They simply could have notified that they were going to release him and we would have gotten him. Police said Lopez Sanchez last lived in Texas where he was on probation. I said Lopez Sanchez has seven felony convictions, four for drug offenses. His most recent deportation was in 2009. He was released from federal prison in March after serving several years for felony re-entry after deportation. Lopez Sanchez is in San Francisco County Jail and faces a homicide charge. ICE has requested another immigration detainer. Tragic story. Keep that in the back of your mind. The suspect in the killing of a San Francisco war woman had been deported five times before coming back and allegedly committing that heinous action. Keep that story in the back of your head. While we read to you this next story, this next story comes to us from NBC News. Again, a network that is anything but a paragon of conservative virtue. NBC News. This story, dated May 30th, 2013, is titled, Experts Say Drug Mules Are Easy to Find, Hard to Catch. The unlikely story of a middle-class Mormon mom of seven being held in Mexico on what may be trumped-up drug trafficking charges has grabbed headlines this week, sparking interest in the shadowy world of drug mules. As Yanira Maldonado's family waits anxiously to learn her fate, thousands of other people are smuggling narcotics over the borders and across the U.S., risking life and liberty for a payday. Couriers are the lowest rung on a drug operations ladder, but indispensable to the kingpins and middlemen who need them to get their illegal product onto the streets. Whether by backpack over the Rio Grande, by car driven through a checkpoint, or in luggage checked onto a plane. Experts say only a small percentage are caught, and the money, a pittance to a Wall Street banker, but a small fortune to an out-of-work Mexican or a meth addict on a downward spiral, is too easy for many to pass up. The first time you're terrified, you almost sleepwalk through it, said Chris Heifner. He wrote a memoir called Mule, about a six-month stint as a Texas-based courier. Then it becomes routine to the point where you just laugh at it. Both Mexicans and Americans drawn to mule work. Government officials say the majority of drug mules are Mexican, but experts say there are plenty of U.S. citizens involved, too. Caleb Mason, a former federal prosecutor and law professor who consults on drug smuggling cases, said an analysis of nearly 4,000 federal busts at Southern California crossings from 2007 to 2010 showed 45% of the suspects were Americans and the rest Mexican. While many drugs are driven in, some marijuana is brought in by backpackers, usually Mexicans or Central or South Americans who hike for hours or even days with loads that weigh up to 50 pounds until they sneak across the border, said Ronald Colburn, former National Deputy Chief of the Border Patrol. Mostly men's work, but one in four mules is female. The field tends to be dominated by men, even though women may be less likely to get profiled. Mason's number crunching revealed that about one in four people caught smuggling was female. Of course, that doesn't account for the people who aren't nabbed. The common denominator among all mules is economic need. This is a form of casual labor, just like construction and field work, but it pays 100 times better, Mason said. Some couriers are also users, said Robert Mazur, a former federal agent who wrote The Infiltrator about infiltrating a Colombian cartel. Your typical profile of a mule from the central Florida area, which is highly active methamphetamine and marijuana region, is a relatively uneducated white male or female economically challenged living in a trailer in a rural area, Mazur said. For those making border runs, 
A key requirement is no chemical criminal record, so they won't be subjected to closer inspection, Mason said. Drug smuggling help not hard to find. Recruiting mules is often an informal word of mouth affair, experts said. There will be people who know you cross a lot, and generally someone will say you want to make a little extra money, Mason said. Americans who cross into Mexico to buy drugs will sometimes be asked if they want to take a load back, Mason said. Some Mexicans are offered a discount by human smugglers to carry drugs as they cross the border, said Colburn, who is now with the command consulting group. Others, he said, have uncles and brothers who are mules. Coletta Youngers of the Washington Office on Latin American Human Rights said women can be coerced or tricked by boyfriends or husbands involved with drugs. In Heifner's case, he said he and his pregnant girlfriend were about to be evicted in December 1999 when he borrowed money from an old friend who was running drugs and convinced him to take 100 pounds of marijuana from Texas to Kansas. Once someone like him gets his hooks into you, he won't give up, said Heifner, 40, who claims he became a drug informant after his first bust. The pay is good, but maybe not as much as you might think. Heifner said he made $8,000 for his run, but many mules make far less. Mason found the average pay for a southwest border crossing was $1,600 for a package that was generally worth more than $100,000, though the fee went up for loads that could expose the cur to a stiffer sentence if they were caught. The going rate for driving a car with secret compartment filled with 50 pounds of meth from Texas to Florida is about $5,000 to $7,000, Mazur said. I know people who have made four to five trips a year, said Mazur who is the president of the investigative firm Chase & Associates. For some folks, seven grand five times a year for driving a car is not bad money. Mexican backpackers get much less, as little as $100 for risky runs across rough terrain, which can involve hiding in caves by day and moving only at night. How risky is it? It's unclear what proportion of mules are caught. The recruiters will often do dry runs with new couriers to make sure they don't look terrified and sweaty when they're questioned at the checkpoint, Mason said. The stashed spots can be incredibly difficult to detect. Entire gas tanks can be removed and replaced with bundles of drugs, or a back bumper can be filled with packages. Customs and Border Pro Protection regularly announce the seizures of narcotics hidden in creative receptacles like statues of Jesus, shoe heels, or sp hairspray cans. Mules have also mules have been known to swallow balloons or condoms filled with heroin. Mason estimated that less than 10%, possibly just 5%, get busted. The median sentence for the California cases he studied was 18 months because many were first offenses, he said. I interviewed a guy once who had a giant truck tires in the back of a pickup stuffed with coke, and he'd done 15 trips, never got caught, Mason said. Mules caught on the other side of the border face a harsher fate, said Youngers. Her group spotlighted a woman who was tricked into bringing a bag of drugs into an airport, forced to confess, and then sentenced to 22 years in prison. Yet for many women, it's a chance they feel they have no choice but to take. You talk to these women and they say, look, I felt like I had two choices, prostitution and getting involved in the drug business, and this was better, she said. So there's an NBC story on drugs coming across the border by way of mules. And remember, we just had that story about the illegal immigrant deported five times who killed the young lady in San Francisco last week. I've got one more story to read you. This comes from the Global Dispatch. The title here of this story is Dozen Illegal Immigrants in Texas Gang Rape 13-Year-Old Girl. This story from July 23, 2013. A 13-year-old female resident of the settlement home for children in Austin, Texas, ran away from the home and ended up in the car of three Latino illegals. They took her to an apartment, the Avalon Palms, where she was raped by a large group of men for several hours. Juan Lozanzo Ortega, 25, and Edgar Gerardo Guzman Perez, 26, have been charged with aggravated sexual assault of a child, both are currently being held in the Travis County Jail and Immigration Detainers. This, of course, is in the story from 2013. The NAFBPO wishes to draw America's attention to the fact that the massive alien population illegally present in the United States, often typified as being nine huddled masses yearning to breathe free, is simply not as so often characterized, the group wrote. The group said in its release that it wants the American people to realize that many illegal immigrants are criminals with nefarious intentions, despite the conventional wisdom in the mainstream media and in Congress. So there was that story. I, I've given you three, I know, very depressing stories today. Three stories that just sock you like a punch to the gut, I know. A story about an illegal alien deported five times, who nevertheless was in this nation, and killed an innocent young lady in San Francisco. A story about 
mules, most of which are Mexican and, and from Central and South America, coming across our borders, bringing drugs into this nation, and getting paid for doing so. And a story about illegal aliens raping a 13-year-old girl. That's what I've put on your plate to start this show today. That's the environment I want you to think about. That's the context I want you to bear in mind as we revisit one issue. And the one issue I want to revisit with those three stories in the back of your mind are the comments, the controversial comments, that Donald Trump made just about a week ago. Recently, Donald Trump, and speaking of Mexicans and illegal aliens, said that they are, quote, bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people, end quote. And for that statement, Donald Trump has been run over the coals many times. He has been fired from NBC. The other business associates, business partners have cut ties with him. And we are being told wherever we might turn, that Donald Trump is a racist and a horrible person and whatever else. But I want you to stop and think about something. Given the three stories that I read to you at length at the top of this program, for whatever you might think of maybe the word choice that Donald Trump used, whatever you might think of the tone of what Donald Trump said, Given the three stories I gave to you at the top of this program, can you say Donald Trump was factually incorrect? No, you cannot. Donald Trump might have been brash in his statements. He might have been caustic in his statements. I'm not saying those are bad things. Not at all, but... You could accuse him of that. You could say he was brash. You could say he was caustic. You could say he was tone deaf. You could say he was racially insensitive. But you can't say he was wrong. And that's what bugs a lot of people. Donald Trump was right. He's catching all kinds of hell for it right now. He's going through all kinds of negative consequences for it right now, although... Given the type of man he is, I'm sure he'll come through it. But he has been put through all of this because he is speaking, at least on this issue, he is speaking the truth. People say it's controversial. Is it controversial because someone's telling you the truth? Is the truth really that controversial? Is the truth so forbidden to say in today's society? That one loses their livelihood, one loses their way of making a living simply for stating facts that are documented. Now make no mistake, I am not a Donald Trump supporter in terms of his presidential bid. I've told you on this show before, I am a Ted Cruz guy, at least at this point. Of the myriad of Republican candidates out there, Ted Cruz is the guy who most closely seems to fit my political beliefs at this point in time. However, I believe that you can support a candidate, you can back a candidate 100%, and still be enough of an adult, enough of a thinking human being, to be able to acknowledge when another candidate who is competing with you makes a statement that is correct, identifies an issue that is worth looking at and does the right thing. And I can do that with Donald Trump. Don't get me wrong. Trump, in terms of his political aspirations, still has a lot of questions that I would need answered before I could support him. If you look back at his history, he has been all over the place on the Second Amendment. Recently, he's been sounding good on it. In the past, not so much. In the past, he's been a little bit more in tune to things like government health care and, and certain other social programs. Now he doesn't seem that way. Has have his 
have his opinions evolved over time, or is he just saying this to get a conservative vote? I don't know, but I'm not comfortable with that until I know more about where he is. But at the same time, acknowledging those misgivings, you can still look at what he said about illegal immigrants and Mexicans and say, no, that is not racist. No, that should be co not be controversial. Yes, it is absolutely right, and I back what he said. I agree with it. Now, many are saying that Donald Trump has been very insulting to Mexicans or Latinos. But I don't agree. What Donald Trump was talking about were those who are committing illegal actions. And frankly, people who do that in our society should be criticized. But furthermore, the question nobody seems to ask is that when it comes to a discussion of illegal immigrants, when it comes to a discussion of illegals coming over here and breaking the law, murdering and stealing and raping and doing all that they do, shouldn't legal Mexicans and Latinos in America, which by the way is far and away the vast majority of Latinos and Mexicans, the vast majority are law-abiding citizens who are citizens, they, are, they did come here the right way, they've done the right thing, they are not who we're talking about. Shouldn't those people be every bit as antagonistic towards illegal aliens as we are? Maybe even more so. After all, there's no doubt, I'm sure, that legal Mexicans, legal American Latinos, undergo a lot more scrutiny than they otherwise would because of the presence of illegal aliens, because of the actions of illegal aliens. They have to undergo a degree of scrutiny that they would not otherwise. Should they not blame those illegal aliens for those actions just as we who are not Latinos or Mexicans do? I should think they, they should. Now, whether they do or not currently as a group is, is an open question. I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. But if it is true that legal Latinos, legal Mexicans in America do not currently in large numbers oppose illegal immigrants for this, then it's us to the rest of us to bring that question up, to bring that topic up, to bring that idea up and try and influence them to oppose illegals the way the rest of us do. We've seen a lot of businesses part ways with Donald Trump prematurely or preemptively this week. Feeling he was too hot to hold, I guess. Fearing that the public backlash, backlash about this would be so great that it would not be worth their while to have Donald Trump on their payrolls or to be associated with him. NBC was the first and probably the most high profile. There have been others since. And I guess in this day and age, I guess this is how NBA programs tell you to do it. When somebody you're associated with says something even the least bit controversial, something that somebody somewhere might give you some blowback on, the best thing to do is just part ways with them and, and, and try to sweep it under the rug. That seems to be what businesses are told. I suppose the theory is that if you do that, it will minimize the opportunity for a backlash. However, I think something's happening here that some of these businesses haven't thought completely through. Because if you notice something, a lot of the public is starting to back Donald Trump on this. Now, I don't give polls a whole lot of credibility this early in the, uh, in the primary process. There's so many candidates out there that it's hard to call anybody a frontrunner. But in the polls that are out there, Donald Trump very clearly did gain a lot of ground after these comments came out. He didn't lose ground. People didn't disassociate themselves with him. He went in, in a lot of polls I've seen from around a 3% to a 12%. And since the front runners for most of these polls are around a 12 or 13 to 14%, that's pretty darn good to the extent that polls matter at all. In addition, when I look at Facebook and Twitter, social media, I'm seeing a lot of people back up Donald Trump and agree with what he said. People that ordinarily would not have been open to hearing him out. A lot of people I know who have been Ted Cruz supporters and supporters of other candidates are now saying they are Donald Trump supporters. I am not in that boat, but I see a lot of people who say that. So clearly, 
what Trump has said is resonating with the American people. I wonder if it's so smart for these businesses to publicly disassociate themselves from him in such a profound way when what he's saying is resonating with such a great deal of the American public. Maybe the backlash that you're fearing could be coming from the other side if you're not careful. And it's not without precedence. Remember a guy named Eric Cantor? He was in the House of Representatives up until 2014. He was an up-and-coming star in the Republican Party. And yet he lost his seat in Congress by way of a primary. And a primary that was really off the radar as far as the nation went. Nobody really gave his primary challenger a chance to beat him. Nobody thought Cantor was in danger, and yet he lost in the primary. He lost because he merely acknowledged the possibility of looking at the idea of some form of amnesty. He didn't even go as far as backing it. He just said he could consider it, and he was gone. Folks, illegal immigration is a huge hot-button issue in America, and nobody's reporting on it. Nobody's talking about how big that is in the American people right now. But ever so often, we're seeing the American people rise up against the illegal immigrants, and they're backing Donald Trump. They blank-canned Eric Cantor. The tide is turning. Folks, that's the first half of the Power Hour. We will be back with more discussion here on Truth Frequency Radio, 90.7 FM, right after this. 